Hey guys, I want to remind you to check out CF Capital. CF Capital is the premier boutique real estate investment firm in the Midwest and Southeast region of the United States. We are a national real estate investment firm with a purpose. We provide property investment and asset management solutions to help passive investors maximize returns on high value multifamily communities. But our investments go far beyond acquisitions. We invest in people. We are in the business of elevating communities and raising the bar for everyone within our ecosystem. CF Capital is a real estate investment firm focused on the acquisition and operation of multifamily assets. We confidently deliver tax advantage, stable cash flow, and capital appreciation with a margin of safety. By investing alongside our team, investors can preserve and grow their wealth without having to deal with tenants, termites, or toilets. Investors come and stay for the outsized returns we create in our deals while appreciating the ancillary opportunity to make a bigger impact that only CF Capital can provide. If you're an investor and want to invest with us, here's how. Learn more about CF Capital at cfcapllc.com or by simply clicking the link in the show notes of this episode. We will see you on the inside of this powerful community. So let's elevate communities together. One of the things in my book, I talk about three things. One, you have to have a higher purpose. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Okay, you're working 80 hours a week. Why? Is there a reason? You need some higher purpose. Why am I doing this? Number two, you need achievement that is connected to that higher purpose. And three, you need to enjoy the process of life itself. Welcome to Elevate the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here. And I'm blessed and grateful to be sitting with the great Marshall Goldsmith today. You are going to learn how to overcome limiting beliefs, how to then shift your behavior towards greater success, greater happiness. And you're also going to learn this little secret on how to live the earned life. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a nugget there so that you understand that this episode is life changing. There is no doubt in my mind, you are going to walk away with tremendous wisdom, tremendous depth, so that you can apply that change to your life immediately, to your business immediately, so that you can achieve greater levels of success for the sake of achieving greater levels of success, not for the fact of achieving greater levels of happiness. And you're gonna learn more about that in in today's episode. I wanna encourage you to buckle up because this episode is so good. Elevate Podcast is is all about mindset, mind expansion, and personal development for high-performing real estate investors, I'm your host, Tyler Chesser, and I'm a professional real estate investor and entrepreneur. It is my job to decode the stories, habits, and multifaceted expertise of world-class investors and other experts to help you elevate your performance and lifestyle. Are you ready to take it to another level? It is time. We are going to raise the bar with the number one executive coach in the world, the number one leadership thinker in the world. And, you know, this is an individual who's worked with some of the world's most recognizable leaders across the world. He actually created the space of executive coaching 40 years ago. You're going to learn about that first call that really got him started on this journey. Um, But uh, I'm so excited to share this with you today. And, you know, I've been in conversation with Marshall for the past few years to have him on the podcast. So today's a very special day and I'm excited to bring this to you. Before we dive into that, I wanna invite you to pay the fee. And the fee is to pay it forward. Share this episode with one person. All you have to do is grab that link in the podcast app and just pay it forward. Send someone a text message, an email, whatever you need to do to pay it forward. The only way that we can continue to grow and continue to provide tremendous value to you is if we earn the value of your introduction. And that is so important to us. It's so important for our continued expansion. And that's what this is all about. It's about continued growth. It's about continued expansion. And we want to make an impact on other people in your world. If you're a result of that, I want to thank you for being here. And we are going to pour into your cup today. And as we do that as well, my last ask before I introduce you to Marshall Goldsmith 
is to invite you to subscribe to the podcast so that you are notified of future episodes. We're going to continue to bring tremendous value and give us a rating and review. It's very helpful for us to hear your feedback. And, um, you know, it's helpful for others as they come across this episode so that they understand that we are showing up for a tremendous, tremendous impact. And with all that said, I want to dive in and introduce you to Marshall Goldsmith, who is the only two-time winner of the Thinkers 50 Award for number one leadership thinker in the world. He has been ranked as the number one executive coach in the world and a top 10 business thinker for the past eight years. Dr. Goldsmith is the author or editor of 36 books, including three New York Times bestsellers that have sold over 2.5 million copies and have been listed bestseller in 12 countries. And by the way, I think it's actually four New York Times bestsellers now. His books, which include The Earned Life, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, and Triggers, have been recognized by Amazon.com as three of the top 100 leadership and success books ever written. And so I am not overstating how powerful of a conversation today's episode is. So I want to thank you for being here and I want to welcome you and, you know, strap you in here because it's time to go on a rocket ship ride with the great Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. The great Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome to Elevate, my friend. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hey, thank you so much for being on the show. And as you mentioned, right before we started recording, it's showtime. So yeah. let's dive in. And we are, I think that this is going to be a really, really special conversation. So I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this. And as we dive in, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to begin with, uh, if you're open to it, is really asking you to give me a little bit of context uh, and tell me about the call that you received many years ago from a Fortune 100 CEO that ultimately began your career as an executive coach. Tell me about that call. Well, it's very interesting because there was no field called executive coaching at all. And I'm a young guy. I was very fortunate. I married a very famous man when I was young, and he I didn't start at the bottom here. My first clients were at McKinsey and IBM and a lot of very big, fancy companies. And so I'm working with this CEO, and we did 360-degree feedback. And he said, I got this kid working for me, young, smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, arrogant, stubborn, know-it-all jerk. He said, it would be worth a fortune to me if I could change this kid's behavior. So I said, I like fortunes. Maybe I could help him. He said, well, I doubt it. I said, maybe I could help him. He said, I don't think so. Then it came up with an idea. So I'll work with this kid for a year. If he gets better, pay me. If he doesn't get better, it's free. You know what he said? Sold. <laughs> Three, five years, I get paid for results. And there was nothing called executive coaching. I just made that up. What did what was the calling that you thought, you know what, I'm willing to take that bet on myself? I mean, how did you how did you feel confident in yourself to be able to go after that? Well, you know, it's very interesting because years ago, this was back in Kentucky, we were brought up very poor. And this guy, Dennis Mudd, we hired him to put on a roof. And he, I was 14, so he has me helping him, and I was attitudinally challenged. But, you know, we worked hard to put on this roof. He's very proud of the roof, and I was proud of the roof. So my dad's name is Bill, so he says, Bill, I want you to inspect the roof. If the roof is high quality, pay me. If it's not, it's all free. Now, Dennis Mudd was poor. He needed the money. And I thought, man, that guy's got class. He's poor, but he's not cheap. He's got a lot of dignity. So I said, I want to be like that guy when I grow up. So I thought, you know, look, you either believe in what you do or you don't. And, you know, it's a good way to test if someone believes what they're saying. Ask them a question. You want to bet on it? They say, I believe it, but I don't want to bet on it. You know what? They don't believe it. They I mean, I believe it. it. Yeah. Here's the money. Guess what? They believe it. So, you know, I bet on it all the time. And, and, and it's also good because it doesn't just put pressure on me. It puts pressure on them. Think about it. That kid doesn't get better. One of us is going to lose. Well, I'm going to lose a little bit. Guess what? He's going to lose. He's going to lose more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going to, I, I could look at the seal and say, don't pay me. Well, not good for me. How about him? Oh, real bad. <laughs> real bad. So, you know, it's, it's good. But it makes some accountability. Get people to take responsibility. It almost feels like initially you were aware that really the core and the root cause perhaps that may have been holding this individual back 
were his beliefs and his behavior instead of like, all right, I want to give you the new tip, the new tip, the new tool, the new strategy, you know, the new tactic. You knew that it was it was kind of more of a core and a root cause. It was beliefs and behavior. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, to start with, you're exactly right. I'm not an expert at changing the content. And the CEO told me the problem wasn't the content. He said, this kid's smart. He's smart. He's hardworking. He knows the answers. He acts like a jerk. His issue was behavior. So the CEO told me that to start with. The other thing is, over the years, I've had a privilege of coaching many great people. One of the greatest people I've ever met in my life is a man named Alan Mulally. Now, Alan was head of Boeing Commercial Aircraft. When he did 9-11, he had to save the company from that terrible situation. He went to Ford. The stock was valued at $1.01. He left was $18.40. Stock went up 1,837% when he was the CEO. And he had a 97% approval rating from every employee in a union company. Think about it. It's unheard of. A union company. Yeah, it is. He's a CEO. 97% approval rating. Unheard of. An amazing man. So I talked to Alan. Now I said, Alan, of all the people I ever coached, you improved the most. And I said, I spent the least amount of time coaching you of anyone. And you were great to start with. So I said, Alan, I made a chart here. On one dimension, it's called time spent with Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension is called improvement. There seems to be a negative relationship between spending time with me and getting better. I said, ah, what should I learn from this chart? He said, well, you know, you got one challenge as a coach. Work with great people. Now, he said, you work with great people who are dedicated and want to get better. Your process is always going to work. Take it to the bank. You work with the wrong people. You're never going to win. So if you were to define that, if you were to, maybe you asked him that question, how would he define a great person? Because you're talking about, you know, the difference in success or failure, seeing through a change and a breakthrough versus, you know, just going through a crazy eight and going through the same process and, you know, spinning your wheels. Well, your clients have to, number one, have courage. It takes courage to look in the mirror and get feedback. Stuff I do is not easy. Two, they have to have humility. You know what I've learned in my job? I cannot help perfect people get better. So this kid comes to me and says, I'm, I don't need to change. Well, don't waste my time. And then number three, it takes discipline. You got to work. You got to do the day to day to day to day work to get better. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, nobody got muscles by watching me lift the weights. Mm. They got to work. Well, I got ranked number one coach in the world for years. And you got my book, The Earned Life, right? Mm -hmm. look, look at the first six pages. Those are my clients. Would you say impressive or not too impressive? Unbelievably impressive. I mean, talking about, you know, the who's who in business across the world. <laughs> they're wonderful. And they're not only impressive, they're nice, they're dedicated, they're hardworking. Hey, look, I get ranked number one coach in the world. Why? Nobody knows I'm a good coach. I get the number one clients in the world. I love that. It's all about them. If you read the first paragraph on that endorsement page, what's it say? It doesn't say I'm great. What's it say? They're great. Mm. They're great. And I'm lucky. And now the clients with courage, humility, and discipline, they're willing to look within to say, what beliefs may be holding me back? They may right. be limiting me. And so when you're having that dialogue with some of these great leaders who have already achieved great levels of success, but have a desire to go to that next level, what are some of the patterns that you see in terms of the limiting beliefs that were currently holding them back that they've been able to break through? I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked that question, what's the number one problem of all the successful people you've coached over the years? My answer is winning too much. And what's that mean? It's important we want to win. Meaningful, we want to win. Critical, we want to win. Trivial, we want to win. And not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners love winning. It is incredibly difficult for winners not to constantly go through life winning. Now, I'm going to give you a case study that almost all of my clients fail. You will probably fail this case study yourself. The listeners will almost all fail the case study. Are you ready? I'm ready. You want, go, you want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. <laughs> Option A, we could critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. And you know this mistake could have been avoided if you just listened to me, 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 me. Option B, shut up. Eat the stupid food. Try to enjoy it and have a nice night. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. <laughs> what should I do? Shut up. <laughs> Let me give you a worse example. You have a hard day at work. You go home. 
your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today. I had such a tough day. If we're not careful, what do we say? You had a hard day. You had a hard day. You have any idea what I had to put up with today? We're so competitive, we have to prove we are more miserable than the people we live with. Hmm. I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tug School. This young guy raised his hand. He says, I did that last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, the addiction, probably. it's... It's this addiction to winning to a certain degree, and, and it almost manifests in, in positive aspects and negative aspects. You're saying that that's kind of a limiting modality that you're seeing a lot of uh, highly successful people ruminate in? Especially big organizational leaders. See, because for the great individual achiever, it might be all about me. For the great leader, it's about them. And what I have to teach people is, look, you're the CEO. You win anyway. You, you're you going to win. You're the big boss. You win. You don't have to prove you're smart. You have to prove anything. Peter Drucker said, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are, not to prove how right we are. It's hard. In our lives, you've got nothing but positive reinforcement for proving you're smart and proving you're right over and over thousands of times. It's hard to stop. And what you need to learn as you move up in leadership is quit doing that. Hmm. You've mentioned, and, and as I'm kind of doing my research on you prior to doing this podcast today, one of the things that I noticed that you've said time and time again is helping people stop to be annoying. <laughs> and I found that to be really, really interesting because, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, who cares if you're annoying or not? Are you effective? But tell me why is annoying a factor to kind of work through? Well, you see, here's the important point. Effective, why? Because of and in spite of. See, this, you, you just identified the classic trap of people I work with. I am successful. I do this. Therefore, I must be successful because I do this. Mm -hmm. Nobody's successful because they're annoying. Nobody's successful because they're a pain in the ass. They're successful in spite of the fact they're an annoying. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. And in terms of annoying, I mean, what are some of those patterns that you observe? Is it, you know, micromanaging? Is it, you know, just the addiction to winning? Is it some of the stuff that you were just describing? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it depends on each person. So what I do for a living is I give people confidential feedback. So my average client has 18 key stakeholders. I interview average 18, could be 20, 50, 30, 10. I interview these people and say, what does this guy do well? What's he need to do better? What situations bring out the best, the worst? What advice to have for him? I ask some basic questions. I write a very long report and I give them feedback. And they say, okay, here's what I'm doing well and here's what I need to improve. Yeah, you know, if they're the CEO, then I get the board to sign off on it. If they're not the CEO, I get the CEO to sign off on it. And then they agree, well, okay, here's what I will get better. And then you get better, I get paid. Hmm. And I say, yeah. look, if this guy gets better at this stuff, it's judged by these people, it's worth this money, yes or no. By the way, if the answer is yes, you can't lose. <laughs> the answer is no, you don't need me. And so the first step through that process and the feedback is identifying, in some cases, annoying behaviors, right? <laughs> Whatever so, it happens to be for each person. Yeah. Got it. Got it. What some are some sort of dysfunctional behavior? What are some examples or, you know, maybe there are examples that you've gone through in your career where you've seen, you know, individuals and maybe maybe it's the Ford CEO that you were just describing, you know, go from a high level of success to almost stratospheric success. What are some of the examples of behaviors that have shifted as a result? Is it really start with the beliefs and the mindset or, you know, where else would you correlate? I would say part of it is this belief that I have to be right or that I am right, or I must prove that I'm right, which is unconscious. I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to just prove to everybody that I'm smarter than them. On the other hand, we do it over and over and over and over and over again without even knowing we're doing it. Uh, so a lot of it is things like I don't listen. I don't involve people. Why? I'm just focused on me. And it's hard. Again, you have to realize I'm coaching leaders. I'm not just coaching individual achievers. I'm coaching leaders. There's a difference. For the individual achiever, it might be all about me. That's fine. For the great leader, it is not all about me. It's about them. And it's incredibly difficult to make this transition from me to them. Uh, for example, many of your listeners might be more entrepreneurial in nature. Okay, that's fine. As long as it's just them, this stuff is not that important. 
Well, and, and I feel like people, it's much more important. I feel like that's the common journey in the real estate investing space is that you're starting, you know, as a rugged individualist and you learn over time that this is a team sport and to achieve levels of success that are worthwhile to help you live this lifestyle, you've got to build a team and you've got to learn how to be a leader. So I think that this is a very, very valuable part of the discussion in terms of recognizing perhaps some self-awareness that maybe there's this belief that I must show others that I'm right. And now we've got to make a shift. Well, the other thing is you have families. Your family doesn't need you to prove you're better than them all the time. If you're married, your wife or husband doesn't need this. Your kids don't need this. And the problem is for most of us, the same stuff we do at work, we do at home. And people I coach, people at home are more important than people at work anyway. Now you saw my book, The Earned Life, a lot of that book was written based on 600 hours of time I spent with 60 amazing people with my friend Mark Thompson. And it's not a secret who they are. And Pal Gasol, the famous basketball star, was in a group, and Curtis Martin from the NFL Hall of Fame, and Kelly Leung, a star of Broadway, and the head of the Olympic Committee, head of the Rockefeller Foundation, head of Cardinal Health, you know, head of Russell Investments. These are big people. You saw their names, not a secret. Every week they talk about their lives. Every week they stand up and say, here's what I'm doing well, here's what I'm screwing up, please help me. I didn't see too many weeks where I didn't say, you know, I had a perfect week last week. Mm. I loved me last week, you know. My wife, my kids, all people work, they just loved me last week. I was kind of a dream person, not too much. <laughs> and by the way, how successful are they? Unbelievably successful. You're talking about people with their names in the rafters of some of the most famous arenas on I the was planet. There. I was there. Pal Gasol's name went up. I was there for the, I was, he invited me to the game. That's so awesome. What an amazing individual too. Wonderful person. I was there when the Lakers retired his jersey. So he invited me to go to that. It was a great fun. We had a great time. Well, and to your point earlier, you know, the most successful, we're talking about legends, Curtis Martin, another a legend in the football space. And you're talking about legends Curtis in Martin, business as well. A wonderful person. He's kicking ass in so many dimensions. He's a nice guy. He helps people. He's making money. He is a wonderful and, and inspirational guy. He and it feels like, like the pattern that I'm seeing too is like they are the most friendly and humble individuals. And they're truly humble because they don't need to prove to anyone that they have greatness within them, right? It almost feels like maybe they've moved beyond that. Yeah, well, they don't have to stand up every week and say talk about their problems. Right. No, they don't have to do any of this stuff then. Now, Curtis Martin helps athletes. I'll tell you, athletes, a lot of ex-athletes are disasters. Mm. Why do you think you, that is? Uh, they become addicted to glamour, glory, achievement, and love. The love of the fans. And all of a sudden, you know, that's gone. When that's gone, it's hard. It is so hard. Uh, Curtis talked to me about this. How do they get rid of all their money? 70% bankrupt. And the, the National Football League is the worst. Mm -hmm. They are the worst. No financial like, intelligence either. 70% bankrupt in like five years. Terrible mm -hmm. numbers, right? You know how they get rid of a lot of their money? They give it away. They just give it away. Why? They're trying to buy love. Hmm. They're trying to buy love. They have these people hanging around. They give them money. Doesn't work. There's a good song about that. Money, you got a lot of friends hanging around your door. When it's gone and spending ends, they don't come around no more. Man. They try to buy love and that just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so it's you know very important to get over that. And it's not easy, by the way. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. One of the things I talk about in my book, The Earned Life, is never become attached to results. Becoming attached to results is a disaster. It's very important for your listeners to know this because they're investors. Don't become, you don't get your ego attached to results for two reasons. One, you don't control the results. A lot of things are outside your control. You think you're a great investor. Yeah, right. Well, maybe the neighborhood crashes, the community crashes, the stock market crashes, interest rates go up. You know, there's a lot of stuff you don't control. And number two, if you become ego attached to results, what happens after you achieve the results? How much peace and happiness does that bring? A minute, a day, a month? Not much. Mm -hmm. More. 
Got to get that next bigger deal, bigger deal, bigger deal, bigger deal, more, more, more. The Buddhist term for this is called the hungry ghost. Always eating, but you're never full. Hmm. One of the guys in our group, Safi Bakal. Safi Bakal, just a brilliant guy. So in, in one of the things in my book, I talk about three things. One, you have to have a higher purpose. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Okay, you're working 80 hours a week. Why? Is there a reason? You need some higher purpose. Why am I doing this? Number two, you need achievement that is connected to that higher purpose. And three, you need to enjoy the process of life itself. So one of the guys in our group is Safi Bakal. And Safi is a scientist, so he talks like a scientist. He said, I've learned one thing in this group. I used to believe that if I achieved more, I would be happy. He said, I finally realized achievement and happiness are independent variables. Achieve to achieve is good. Be happy to be happy. They're not the same thing. And I said, you know, Safi, I'm really glad you realized that because you already have a PhD in physics from Stanford. You started four businesses and made a zillion dollars. You wrote a New York Times bestselling book called Loon Shots, and you consulted presidents. If that is not enough achievement to make you happy, do you really believe a little bit more is going to make any difference? Mm. You can't get attached to that stuff. Albert Berlig, he's one of the people that endorsed my, my book, CEO Pfizer. I called him a couple of years ago. Albert, how's it going? He said, hey, pretty good. Came up with that vaccine, you know, saved a billion lives here and there. I'm good. I said, I took a vaccine. Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> good job. Good job. And then he said, you know, stock price all time high, employee engagement through the roof. I said, Albert, what's your problem? He said, I have a huge problem next year. If Albert's value as a human being is based on achievement, he can write it off. He'll never do it again. You don't want him to do it again. We don't want him to have another year where he saves a billion lives. Right. It's not going to happen again. Michael Phelps, 25 gold medals. What do you think about doing after winning number 25? Killing himself. Mm -hmm. That's it. You can't get addicted to that stuff. If you do, you're never going to get there. This is such a powerful discussion. The, the unattachment to results, I think is such a challenging thing for so many people who are achievement oriented, who have built the, who have strengthened the muscle of, you know, going through challenge, going through pain, going through discomfort, uncertainty to get to the other side for triumph. And that is a very addicting thing. And so becoming detached from the results, how do you do that? Well, the first question is then what? Let's say you go through all that and you quote triumph. Okay. Then what? You do the victory lap. That's nice. Then you got to start over, right? What happens after the victory lap? Got to start from the beginning again. Over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't stop. Jack Welch. Uh, well, there's interesting research called the marshmallow. One of the parts I like about the book is a marshmallow study. So they had a study about kids and marshmallows. I love this part. So you give the kid a marshmallow. You say, you know, kid, you eat one, you get one. But if you wait, oh, two, two. And allegedly, they do longitudinal research. And the kids that ate one are losers. The kids that eat two are big winners. Allegedly. Anyway, that's fine. Here's what they didn't do, though. And the point of the book is delayed gratification is good. Delayed gratification is good. Almost every self-help book, delayed gratification is good. Work out more. Run more. Delayed gratification is good. One minor problem with all this stuff. They didn't take the kid that had two marshmallows to say, you know, kid, wait a bit more. Three. Ooh, let's wait some more. Four, five, ten, a hundred, a thousand. Where's the story end? Old man sitting in a room waiting to die, mm. surrounded by thousands of uneaten marshmallows. See, sometimes you got to eat the marshmallow. And you were talking about this Buddhist concept of hungry ghost. Um, it feels like my my thought on this is the concept of impermanence where you know everything is you know that that happens to you no matter what it is whether your perception of it is good or bad it's right. impermanent so you just you're kind of an observer through this journey and you're growing as a result of it does it does that resonate with you in terms of this concept and how it's interrelated oh definitely and let's talk about your specific listeners here's my guess i don't know your listeners but i'm give you a guess my guess is there's these three dimensions. One is called aspiration. And you can get lost in aspiration. Some people are lost in their heads. They've got these grandiose ideas. They don't really achieve anything, but you know, they, they think a lot. The other is the action phase, which is they're kind of addicted to 
watching video games. They do the day-to-day -day life, and, you know, they just stumble through. And most of our ancestors, that was their lives. Our ancestors, they have the luxury of long-term ambitions or anything else. They were just trying to stay alive. My guess is your listeners have another problem, though. They're addicted to achievement. Mm -hmm. They're addicted to achievement, and they actually believe that somehow if I achieve more, it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay when they have some fantasy of once I get to this place, everything is going to be just fine forever. That's the great Western disease. I'll be happy when I get the money status, BMW condominium. I will be happy when there is no when there's only one book that has the same ending and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's a fairy tale. That's not the real world. When is now? This is it. This is it, right? Now, how old are you? 34. 34. Now, you can look at me and say, easy for you to say you're a rich old man and got all these sold 3 million books and you have this and that and the other, right? Easy for you to say. Right. That would be people's first uh, inclination to this conversation. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Easy for you to say, well, let's take you and me. You see, you got one thing I don't have. You know what that's called? 40 years. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll tell you what, you want some money? I'll throw you a few million bucks. You send me the 40 years, we probably get a deal. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to trade that 40 years in for a few million bucks? I don't think so. So to your point, the grass is always greener. The concept, no matter where you are, the grass is always greener. So be grateful for where you are in your journey. What have you got that I don't have? 40 years. Mm -hmm. How important is that? I love that. So tell yeah. me, you know, you've, you've obviously coached some of the most successful leaders in the world. So why do they need a coach? Is it to reflect upon these type of concepts or what else have you seen? I have a, a question. How many of the top 10 tennis players in the world have a coach? Every single one of them. Well, why? To get better, to there perform at the highest levels, right? I think you just answered your own question. Didn't you? <laughs> and, you know, being in their corner, you have found, it seems, that you have these this type of dialogue where you see that people may be spinning their wheels in a direction that, first of all, is not leading them to a life of fulfillment, which right. then leads them to a greater level of success. Because if you're living a happy life, you're more likely to be operating in your zone of genius, right? Eh, 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 eh. Wrong thinking, wrong thinking. I love it. Thinking. Tell me, wrong Marshall. Thinking. Wrong thinking. You see, Marshall, really, the reason to have a happy life is if you're happy, you see, you'll actually achieve more. That's wrong thinking. Achieve to achieve. They're miserable. That, that follow your bliss and the money will come is all bullshit. That is all bullshit. Every waitress in Hollywood followed their bliss and they're waiting on tables, right? Yeah, sure. Follow your bliss and money. That's nonsense talk. Look, be happy to be happy and achieve to achieve. Don't sit there and say, I'm going to be happy because it's going to help me make money. Elevate Nation. You know you can't manage what you don't measure. So when it comes to marketing and sales, how can you be sure your decisions are the right ones? I've got the answer for you. Sharp Wilkinson. Sharp Wilkinson is a unique agency that specializes in developing data-driven marketing and sales strategies for clients. I've been working with Sharp Wilkinson for a while now, and I can personally attest to the way that they immerse themselves in my organization and maintain a hyper-responsive orientation. Best of all, they use data to inform their strategies and drive real tangible growth. And every company needs continuing growth, right? If you think your organization could benefit from data-driven marketing and sales, growth starts at Sharp Wilkinson. Visit sharpwilkinson.com to take the first step on your journey. Tell them Tyler sent you. Now, speaking of achievement, how can yeah. we close the gap between what we believe is possible, what we plan to achieve, and what we actually get done? And, you know, removing the concept of just the feeling of happiness, but thinking right. about, you know, the gap there, because a lot of people have these big plans, these big aspirations, you just described a few, but how can you close that gap? Well, I'll tell you one, I'm going to give everybody one strategy that takes three minutes a day, cost nothing and it's going to help you get better in almost anything three minutes a day cost nothing help you get better some people are skeptical right now three minutes a day cost nothing help me get better ridiculous too good to be true half the people quit in two weeks and they don't quit because it does not work they quit because it does work so this is called the daily question process you want to get better at anything get out of spreadsheet 
on one column, you write down a list of questions to represent what's most important in your life, friends, family, colleagues, whatever. Uh, it could be work, health, anything. Every question has to be answered with yes or no or a number, seven boxes across, one for every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And every week you fill out the little form. See, at the end of the week, you get a report card. Ooh, I'm going to warn everybody in advance. A report card at the end of the week, not as beautiful as the corporate values plaque she's stuck up on the wall. <laughs> See, I, I've been doing this 25 years. You know what I've learned? Life is incredibly easy to talk. And life is incredibly difficult to live. So you do this every day. You're not looking at those talk values. Oh, those are beautiful. I'm a wonderful person. I love my family. I'm in shape. You know, blah, blah, blah. Talk. Live is hard. Look, this is hard to do. The average person quits within two weeks. They can't do it. It's hard. I have someone call me every day to help me for 25 years. Why? My name is Marshall. I go rank number one leadership thinker and executive coach in the whole world. I have someone call me to help me daily. Why? I'm too cowardly to do any of this stuff by myself. Mm. I'm too undisciplined to do any of this stuff by myself. I need help. And it's okay. We all need help. Hey, Pal Gasol, you mentioned him. You know, he had to get back in shape to make it to the Olympics. He had a personal trainer live in his home. He'd do every day working out. Now, why do you have a personal trainer? You think he didn't know what the trainer told him to do? Accountability, right? Trainer, I'd make sure he did it. <laughs> it's not easy at his age to go back to the Olympics. This is the fifth Olympics for him. That wasn't easy. He's like 41 years old. I think that's hard work. Well, he had a trainer every day. Why? He's smart. He's not going to do it on his own. He knows. Do you think he doesn't know how to work out? Guarantee he knows how to work out. Of course he does. That doesn't mean he's going to do it. You think, you think I don't know these questions I, every day that I fill out? I, I, I know the questions. So what are the questions and what does this weekly report card actually look like? Well, I'll give you some of my questions. For example, one of mine is how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it? Mm. Well, I don't see too many zeros in my scorecard. Kind of hard for that old professor not to be right all the time. Or how many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? Oh, I don't see enough zeros on that one either. And we don't want other people stabbing us in the back. How come we keep stabbing them in the back? How many steps did you take? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups did you say or do something nice to your wife, your son, your daughter, your grandkids? It's questions about life every day. And every day, you fill out that little form. Now, I'm going to give your listeners six questions. By the way, send me an, uh, an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I'll send you an article about this. And I'll also send anybody who wants to send me an email. I'll send you my questions. But my questions are not intended to be your questions. They're just by way of example. Everybody write your own questions. But I'm giving you six questions I recommend for everybody. And they all begin with a phrase called, did I do my best to? Did I do my best to? Now, let me tell you why that's an important question. It doesn't say you succeeded. Just says, did you even try? See, that's what's hard about it. You know why? You can't blame somebody else. See, the one thing you can control is, did I do my best? This is hard. Question one, every day, did I do my best to set clear goals? Question two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? Question three, did I do my best to be happy? Let's talk about that one. Did I do my best every day to be happy? One to 10 scale. Every day, 10 is high, one is low. Did I do my best to be happy? In my book, Triggers, I talk about three people I coach, and I, obviously I can use their names, three of the smartest people I've ever met. One of them is Dr. Jim Kim. Now, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, head of Partners in Health, saved millions of lives. His name's there in the book. And, uh, you know, Dr. Jim Kim was the president of Dartmouth College, and then he went on to be president of the World Bank and has a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology in five years. Now, put this in context. A normal human to get a PhD in anthropology from Harvard takes eight years. Oh, he got one in five years, got a medical degree, same time. Amazing. Dr. Ross Shaw, head of the United States Agency for International Development at age 37 years old. Now he's head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And Dr. John um, Noseworthy, CEO of the Mayo Clinic. So these all medical doctors, none stupid. I asked him a question independently. Average day, how much score in the answer to this question? Did I do my best to be happy today? You know what they all said? Same answer. Never dawned on me to try to be happy. Hmm. Never dawned on me to try to be happy. Now, they're all medical doctors. So I said, well, you know, really, did it dawn on you you're going to die? Hmm. 
they cover that one in medical school there, death. They bring that up. I said, oh, yeah, they brought that one up, death. I said, do you think this is a silly question or a stupid question? He said, no. It's an important question I forgot to ask. An important question I forgot to ask. Well, every day ask yourself, did I do my best to be happy today? By the way, the average person in the world, 5.5 out of 10. Mm. Not so good. Next question, did I do my best to find meaning? And instead of waiting for somebody else to give you a meaningful life, did you try to create meaning in your own life every day? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Instead of waiting for everybody else to love you, did you love them? And finally, did I do my best to be fully engaged? That one is harder at home than at work. It's very hard at home. You're using a cell phone in front of your, you have kids? I do. Yeah, don't use a cell phone in front of your kids. It is, uh, I, I think about that so constantly and, you know, it's interesting. I, our kids are really young, but, you know, they, they don't want to see it and you're totally disengaged. They don't know anything about the phone, but if you're looking at the phone, you're not engaged with anyone else. That is it. And I could tell you what, you got little kids, they see you do that now, wait till they're 14 or 15, they get their cell phone, right. they, will, they won't talk to you. Mm -hmm. They will not talk to you because you know what? You taught them that. And so asking yourself these type of powerful questions of, did I do my best to do these different things? Every Over day. time, you find that you start to change your behavior. I would imagine you start to ask yourself these type of questions, right? Yeah, you get better. On the other hand, look, everybody in that little group asks themselves those questions every day. And every week they did a report card. See, here's the problem. You don't stop being a human being. You can achieve all kinds of stuff and have money and fame and blah, blah, blah. You know what you are? And like it or not, we're still just humans. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we screw up every day. You go home, you act like an idiot. You yell at your wife. You're upset with a kid. Do dumb things. Look, I, I, in my bio, I don't know if I mentioned this, I have an incredible gift. I got the ability to seem like I screw something up every day. <laughs> every day I, seem like, you know, I screw something up here. How about you? Do you ever notice you have this ability on a daily basis to screw something up? Well, you're, you're human. That's it. It doesn't stop. It totally. Doesn't stop. Nobody's going to be perfect here. Well, and I, I, what I notice is that a lot of people in our world you know, we have the ability to notice that, but we also have the ability to beat ourselves up as a result of those screw ups. Oh, yeah. Now, that's one thing I'm good at. I got many problems. That's one. I, I'm, I'm great. Every day, one of my daily questions is, do you declare victory in life? One to 10 scale, my average score 10. Every day, I'm declaring victory in life here. And I feel yeah. like these questions are really the detachment to the outcomes because it's just, did I do my best to? It's not, did I create something? It's, did I do my best to show up? Who is the best college basketball coach in history? John Wooden was a coach of UCLA. Greatest coach in history. He never focused on winning, never. He focused on one thing, do your best. You know what he said? If you do your best and win, be proud. If you do your best, lose, be proud. When you don't do your best and win, you have nothing to be proud of. And John, he focused on one thing, do your best. That's all. That was it. And by the way, did he win a few games? He won a couple. I think he, you know, maybe 11 championships. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, yeah, just a couple. Coach K at Duke, same thing. Never focus on results. So the player hits the shot, jumps up and down. Yay. You know what he does? Next play. Mm -hmm. Next play. Player hits a shot. All the missed. Next play. Two words. Two words. From him. Next play. You never focus on what you did. What you did is over. So what about that feeling of, you know what? We did our best. We continue to do our best. But man, there's just so much, so much out of our control that's happening. You know, how do you balance that persistent need to win and, you know, but also say, let's do our best, but also balancing that with some yes. of the feeling of unfairness. Oh, unfairness. Wah, 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 wah. Unfair. I don't think anybody on this call should ever bring up the topic of unfairness. I agree. I went to Africa in 1984 and there's a picture of me down, kneeling down on the ground next to this woman. She's measuring the arms of kids. And if their arms are too big, they don't get any food. They're not hungry enough. Their arms are too little, they're going to die anyway. They go over there. Wow. They're in the middle. They got food. So I get that picture. I keep it there in my library. I look at that thing every day. I'm home. Yeah. So let's don't, I don't think anybody in this call, any you or me or anyone listening to this call at all. Great should reminder. Ever, should ever bring up the topic of unfairness. Wah, wah, wah. Unfairness <laughs> compared to what?
people listening to you right now are among the luckiest people that ever lived. I completely agree. And, you know, such a great reminder to recognize that our problems or what we think or we perceive our problems are so minuscule into, you know, and compared to some things that, you know, other people go through across the world. Let me tell you, I had a funny story about this. Just uh, two days ago, I was, I'm, I've got my own, I'm developing my own computer bot, Marshall bot. By the way, this is cool. Marshall bot. Do you know anyone else that has their own AI bot, which is designed to <laughs> You know, if we fast forward in a few years, we probably will. But I have to say, no, I don't today. I'm it. Not too many (laughs) people got their own AI computer bot. Well, I got somebody spending a few million bucks developing Marshall bot for me. That's awesome. This is totally cool. So I'm talking yesterday, or day before yesterday, I'm talking to these people. I said, you know, one thing I'm having trouble with here is my Marshall bot is really good on the content. But I'm having trouble with Marshall bot getting more personality, a little more humor, fun, you know. (laughs) And the guy he said, let me help you. This is called a first world problem. When your problem <laughs> is your computer bot is not demonstrating an adequate sense of humor. I, I think most people, <laughs> most people probably, yeah, really, how bad is this? Yeah, yeah, my, my own personal computer bot is not funny enough. Well, you know, other people probably have deeper issues than me. <laughs> no doubt about it, man. That is hilarious. And uh, it, it does remind us about all of the blessings that we have, right? And so there's so many things to be grateful for, no matter where you are in your journey. If you're building a bot or, you know, you've got food and water, you know, you got a shelter above your head. Yeah, look, mostly, you, you, mostly people listening, they live in nice homes, making a few bucks. How bad is it? What is the definition or what is your definition of an earned life? because you wrote the book and I definitely want to encourage the listeners to go pick it up and all of your other books. But what is your definition of an earned life? Earned life is when your, your efforts, your focus and your mission is all aligned with a higher sense of purpose, regardless of results. And the key to that definition is regardless of results that, you know, you don't control results. And ultimately we all get the same result. We're all going to die anyway. So that's, that is the ultimate result of all of So you're going to die anyway. So the idea is I'm focused on a higher mission and I am achieving and I enjoy the process of life. You know, uh, Jack Welch, you got a funny story in the book about Jack Welch. So Jack Welch has triple bypass surgery. He's afraid he might die. Then he, you know, gets surgery. He's going to be okay. So my friend asked him, well, you know, Jack, what'd you learn about life there when you almost died? You know what he said? Why am I drinking the cheap wine every night? (laughs) Wait, I'm Jack Welch. I am rich. I've got a wine cellar filled with fancy wine and I'm drinking cheap wine because I'm waiting for the wine in my wine cellar to live ready for this, to appreciate in value. Oh my gosh. That's insane. Yep. Jack Welch. Now how much is his net worth going to change because the appreciation of the wine? (laughs) So true. He said, this is insane. I no, you know what? He made one commitment after that. You know, he said no more cheap wine. (laughs) <laughs> and no more cheap wine. No, 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 no. I'm drinking a good wine because he almost died. So what, what, you know, excuse me, what am I saving this stuff up for? There's a, ba- I feel like there's this, this, um, you know, this, I guess, opening of your mind when you start to really connect with death and you start to look at things differently, you start to behave differently. You start to say, you know what, every day, this could be my last. And instead of waiting for the wine to appreciate, which is really not going to make a big difference in your financial life, you start to enjoy the finer things. And you start to be more present. A couple hundred million bucks. What's the care, right? (laughs) This is insane, right? Of course it was insane. You know, and, and so this is, that was an unconscious belief of his before he, you know, encountered death. Right. So how can we bring more consciousness to this deep truth that we all share, right? We're all going to die at one point. Well, okay. I'm going to kind of, that's my final answer. Save that question for the last question. Okay. I love that. That's my finishing question. All right. We'll put it, we'll put put that on the table on the, on the bookshelf here. And uh, I let's, let's get to the rapid fire section of the podcast, which is the rare air questionnaire. It is uncommon to be unattached to outcomes. It's uncommon to live this earned life to say, you know what, let's, let's live today. Let's be happy now instead of achievement oriented that says, when I do this, then I can be. I didn't say don't be achievement oriented. All I said is do not become ego attached to results. Mm, Big, thank you for that clarification. 
Yeah, I appreciate achievement that. Achievement is fine. Achievement is good, right? Achieve to achieve. Don't think if I achieve, I will be happy. Or like you said, if I'm happy, I will achieve. Mm. What did Safi say? Happiness and achievement are independent variables. I love that. I love achieve that. To achieve, which is good. Be happy to be happy, which is good. Find meaning to find meaning, which is good. Do not assume all these things are somehow connected magically. They aren't. Thank you for that clarification. And I'm going to have to re-listen to that piece a few times to really uh, integrate that within my own thinking. But I appreciate that. And, and as we dive into the rapid fire section of the podcast, I want to ask you a few questions before we get to that final question that we put on the table there. Uh, yeah. If you had to, as being a number one New York Times bestselling author, you know, multiple times over, talk to me about being a reader yourself. If you had to point to two or three of the most impactful books that you've read over the past few years, what would those be and why? Number one would be Old Path, White Clouds by Tick, T-H-I-C-H, Naktong. I mean, look, it was a great book. It's a Buddhist book. I'm a Buddhist. So anyway, and my favorite movie is The Wizard of Oz. The great, I don't know if you know this, the guy that wrote the book was a Buddhist, uh, wrote the movie was, a, that wrote the book for the movie was a Buddhist. I didn't know that. The movie is a Buddhist movie. And it's all about looking for stuff that you already have. Scarecrow had brains throughout the entire movie. At the end of the movie, he didn't know he had a brain. He always had a brain. Dorothy could always go home. They all had it. They just didn't know they had it. The answer, the point of the whole movie is the answer is not out there. The answer is in here. I love that. Thank you for sharing in that. In the West, we are barraged with one art form over and over. You may have seen this art form before. You know what it is? There is a person. No, they're sad. Ooh, they spend money. Ooh, they buy a product and they become happy. This mm. is called commercial have you ever seen one of those mm -hmm. <laughs> how many million times over and over same message over and over and over the message is the answer is out there there's not enough products you're going to buy to be happy I love that. Yeah, this is uh, this is powerful stuff. And I think sometimes we have to slow down to recognize that it's all within us. And, you know, it's not like we have to go acquire this happiness. You cannot, in fact, acquire the happiness. Daily questions. I love Do that it. every day. And those questions are great. I mean, I'm jotting these things down and I'm like, all right, time to integrate because these are these are powerful. And, and it's way, like, everything. You, no reason you can't do this. On the other hand, that doesn't mean it's easy to do. Mm -hmm. Anybody tells me this stuff's easy to do. You know what I've learned? You never did it. Mm -hmm. You think it's easy to do. You've never done it. It's not easy to do. And you talked about having an accountability partner on these questions over the past 25 years. What does that actually look like? They call me up. And he asks you, he or she asks you these questions? Either that or they just say, did you answer all of these questions? Okay. And it's a yes or no? Yeah, that's it. I love it. It's hard. By the way, very easy to not do this. Easy to do, easy not to do. You know, that's uh, that's such a big distinction too. Yeah, very easy not to do this. It's mm -hmm. hard. It's, painful. it's embarrassing to do this every day. It's embarrassing. Every day we screw up. You know, I didn't work out. I ate too much. I acted like a fool. You know, blah, 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 blah. Every day. And as you reach this embarrassment with yourself, you learn an opportunity or you identify an opportunity for growth. If you have the humility to say, look, it's not about my ego saying I'm perfect. It's okay. Course correct. You know what else you identify an opportunity to forgive yourself. That's powerful. Yeah. I don't know you, but my guess is uh, you probably are heavily focused on achievement. You probably could do a better job of forgiving yourself. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. So take a breath. Think of all the previous versions of you. Think of all they've given to you that's listening to me. What should you say to those nice people? Thank you. Now, did they make some mistakes? Let it go. By the way, you want your kids to be able to forgive themselves? You go first. Great let stuff. Them, let them watch you forgive yourself. I love that. I love that. Marshall, this is great stuff. And this this may be a little bit of a challenging question for you, but, you know, because I feel like you do this in so many ways, but what is the biggest way that you elevate others around you? Well, I, I don't try to make people what they're not or what they don't want to be. I just try to help them be what they do want to be. So I never try to, quote, inspire people or any of that stuff. I work with great people who want to get better. 
Now, I'm not an expert. People ask me how to motivate people that don't care. I don't. I don't work with people that don't care. They don't care. It's fine. Don't. I just work with people that do care. That's hard enough. Yeah, so I only work with people that want to get better. They don't want to get better. Let it go. By the way, have you ever tried to change a husband, wife, or partner had no interest in changing? How'd that work out for you? Not so good. <laughs> Did you ever try to change mommy or daddy who had no interest in changing? Not going to happen. I was, I, when I was teaching my class at Dartmouth, this woman raised her hand. I said, are you trying to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. Said, <laughs> Daddy's problem. She said, he doesn't have a healthy lifestyle. I asked her, how old is daddy? She said, 94. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the old boy alone. Man. You, want, you want to smoke a cigar? Smoke too. Who cares? You're 94, right? Quit badgering the old man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Marshall, this is great stuff. And uh, as we reach the, the end of our conversation here, as we were talking about earlier was, you know, unconscious behavior. We were talking about unconscious beliefs and, you know, bringing those to the awareness so that you can be conscious to make a change. So talk to me about your thoughts there. Well, I said, here's my final advice for everybody. Are you ready? Ready. Take a deep breath. Ah, imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. Right before you take that last breath, you're given a beautiful gift. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person that's listening to me right now. The ability to help that person be a better leader. More important, have a better life. What advice would that wise old person who knows what was important and what wasn't? have for the you that's listening to me right now. Eh, whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of performance appraisal, that's the one that's gonna matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did. That old person says you made a mistake, you did. You don't have to impress anybody else. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who are dying, got this question, what advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words, be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not after I get that next deal, not after I get that next million dollars. Be happy now. Don't get so busy chasing what you do not have. You cannot appreciate what you do have. Learning point number two, friends and family. Never get so busy climbing that ladder of success. You forget the people who love you. That's a big mistake. When you're 95 years old, they're the only people going to be there waving goodbye. And the other thing is you have a dream, go for it, because you don't go for it when you're 34. You may not when you're 54, and you probably won't when you're 84. Business advice in whichever. Number one, life is short. Have fun. Real estate investing is fun. I'm not a great real estate investor, but I made lots of money. You know, it's fun. Yeah, my son does real estate investing. He's done great. It's fun. It's almost fun when you make money. You know? It's fun. <laughs> and number two, um, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. The 95-year-old, you will be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you do not. And if you don't believe that's true, interview any CEO who has retired. I've interviewed very many and ask them a question. What are you proud of? None told me how big their office was, how much money they made. All they talked about is people they felt. And final advice, go for it. The world is changing. Real estate is changing. Do what you think is right. May not win. At least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We all regret the risk we fail to take. As I'm growing older, like my mission in life's gotten simpler and simpler. Let's say Tyler here, that maybe one or two people listening to us have a little better life based on this little session. Good use of my time. Good use of my time. So thank you for inviting me. Marshall, what an amazing individual you are. And I want to acknowledge you for helping people. So many people and, and, you know, we have a tendency to overcomplicate so many things. And what I feel like we're coming to at the conclusion of this conversation is profound simplicity and wisdom. And you've spent your life chasing that. So I just want to acknowledge you. I want to thank you so much for helping us ask powerful questions, which can help us shape our own behavior. Marshall Goldsmith, until next time, my friend, thank you so much for being a part of Elevate Podcast. And the listeners can find you at marshallgoldsmith.com. Where else can they find you, Marshall? Uh, go to LinkedIn. I've got 1.5 million followers. So no, I'm always happy to have a couple more. I love that. We will put a link in the show notes as where the listeners can find you, Marshall. Until yeah. next time, my friend, have oh, an amazing an day. Marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. Send me an email. I don't care. I like getting emails. I love it. I love it. And he will respond. I know from personal uh, experience here. So uh, Marshall, have a great day, my friend. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye. Elevate Nation Marshall Goldsmith, one of the world's greatest 
thinkers, greatest coaches. And we just received a tremendous gift from Marshall Goldsmith today. I can tell you that those questions that were talking about uh, in this discussion are game changers. I'm excited to integrate the continual asking of those questions myself and having other people hold me accountable to ask about, did I do my best to set clear goals, to make progress towards my goals, to be happy, to find meaning, to build positive relationships, to be fully engaged? You know, ultimately, I know that uh, achievement, and, and I love learning that too, by the way, achievement and happiness are not related. They should not be related. Achievement for achievement's sake is okay. And I love just the, uh, you know, the invitation there. Uh, happiness for happiness is okay. And it's our birthright as well. And I just loved this conversation. I think it's, it was a challenging conversation. It was one of those that, you know, asked me to really dig deep. Uh, but it's also challenging for all of us to engage in to say, well, you know, what are we taking away from this? How are we integrating this into our own belief system, into our own dialogue, into our own behavior to do our best and to show up every day and to be fully engaged. So I want to encourage you to re-listen to the show. Repetition is the mother of all skill, but it's also the repetition of all fulfillment. You know, <laughs> repetition is the mother of fulfillment, especially in terms of this conversation. And if you want to take your success to the next level, for the sake of taking your success to the next level, there are a lot of patterns that we have integrated within this conversation with Marshall Goldsmith today and what he's been able to achieve with his clients. Some of the greatest, you know, most successful entrepreneurs, leaders, CEOs across the world recognize this pattern has left so many clues. Success leaves clues. So while some may say, well, wait a minute, we need some more complexity here. We need more sophistication in the way that we're approaching our strategies or, or you know, our execution. I think ultimately the reminder is that it's all within us. Everything that is required to live a happy life, to live a very highly successful life is already within us. And, you know, it's not out there. So look within and, um, I encourage you to share this episode with a friend, have a discussion with them about what you learned and maybe some changes or maybe some humility that you want to step into. Maybe some recognition that you've got an opportunity to grow because guess what? We always do. And I think the people that most resonate with this podcast are those that have humility. If you feel like you have opportunity to grow in that area, I invite you to step into that growth and to find more humility and the willingness to learn and grow uh, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. I want to thank you so much for investing in yourself. I want to congratulate you for doing so. Until next time, Elevate Nation, we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.